Many World War II fans wonder if Marshal Erwin Rommel and Marshal von Manstein had some kind of relationship during the years of the conflict. Next, in this program, we are going to analyze how the very important meeting that both leaders of the Wehrmacht had was, and in addition, we will see at the end what Manstein's visit to Hitler in his Berlin bunker was like, shortly before the Soviet attack on the capital. With that said, let's get started. We meet on July 13, 1943. Location, Hitler's headquarters in East Prussia, near the small town of Rassenburg. On this occasion, the Führer has summoned Marshals Rommel, Kluge, and Manstein to his headquarters to analyze the situation and plan the next steps to be taken. The general context is the following. On the Eastern Front, the German offensive on Kursk had stalled after eight days since its launch, and the Soviets had moved on to counterattack in the Oral Basin, north of the Kursk salient, and in the south in the Donetsk Basin, imminent attacks were expected. On the other hand, in the Mediterranean, the Allies had just landed in Sicily, and if the Germans did not manage to act quickly, the situation in Italy threatened to collapse completely. So, once again it seemed that the Germans were going to need a miracle to get out of that situation. After a long debate, it was decided not unanimously that Operation Citadel in Kursk had to be suspended, the Donetsk Basin and the Oral Salient had to be reinforced, and finally, it was also decided that troops had to be sent to Italy. After the conclusion of this meeting, Manstein and Rommel met for dinner at a house within the large Wolf's Lair complex, and together with Kluge, they talked until late into the night. During dinner, the three marshals discussed the military situation again, but they did not agree on the consequences of what was happening in Kursk and the Allies' amphibious operation in Italy. Unlike Kluge and Rommel, who were of the opinion that Germany's military defeat was inevitable, Manstein still believed in the possibility of securing a draw on the Eastern Front, thereby preventing a full-scale Anglo-American invasion of Western Europe. Finally, after a hard debate, in which Manstein proposed completely abandoning Italy to send everything to the Eastern Front, Kluge got up to go to sleep, but before leaving the room, he told Manstein the following as a sentence. Man's time, the end will be disastrous. And I repeat what I told you before, I am ready to serve under him. But what did Kluge mean when he told Man's time that he was ready to serve under him? Already at the end of 1942, while the Battle of Stalingrad was taking place, Man's time had been approached to participate in a coup d'etat against Hitler, which was finally carried out by Stauffenberg on July 20, 1944. The point is that Manstein he had been promised that if he participated in the coup d'etat, he would be proclaimed commander-in-chief of the Wehrmacht, and the entire German military apparatus would be subordinated to him. So, with these words Kluge once again asked him to betray Hitler. Faced with this comment, Manstein limited himself to wishing Kluge good night. After the withdrawal of the commander-in-chief of Army Group Center, Manstein and Rommel were left alone in the room where they had dined. According to Manstein's assistant, named Stahlberg, who later narrated this event, Rommel spoke up and once again told Manstein the following. The end of the war will be the greatest apocalyptic event that Germany has ever experienced. If the Allies also land in the Balkans, and eventually on the Atlantic coast, the entire nation will collapse. Manstein's response was that the situation had not yet reached that point, and therefore was not as bad as what Rommel was describing to him. Manstein assured him that if it ended up reaching that situation, he was convinced that Hitler would voluntarily renounce supreme command of military operations, and would appoint someone more qualified to lead the German army. Faced with Manstein's such hope, Rommel replied the following. The Führer will never voluntarily renounce supreme command. Obviously, I know you much better than you, Herr von Manstein. Manstein did not know how to respond to what Erwin Rommel had just told him, and on the other hand, he did not see that talking about these matters of treason in Hitler's own headquarters was the most convenient thing to do. In this way, he got up from the table with the intention of going to sleep, and said goodnight to Rommel. Before Manstein left, the Desert Fox's last words were again as follows. I am also ready to serve under him. And immediately afterwards, both men said goodnight to each other and said goodbye. 
Once Manstein left the room, Rommel stayed talking to his assistant Stahlberg, and told her that Manstein was a brilliant strategist, and that he greatly admired him. However, on this issue he was completely wrong. Finally, Rommel told Manstein's aide to do everything possible to change his mind. Rommel was not at all wrong in the warnings he had given Manstein about Hitler, and Manstein was able to verify this on two subsequent occasions. These took place during the summer of 1943 and the winter of 1944, in meetings in which Manstein proposed to Hitler that he appoint himself supreme head of the Wehrmacht, or at least commander-in-chief on the Eastern Front. Of course, on both occasions, Manstein's proposals were rejected. Manstein was finally dismissed during the last days of March 1944, just a few months before all German fronts completely collapsed. This collapse came after the launch of Operation Vagration by the Soviets in June, and the Allied landings in Normandy during that same month. At the time of his dismissal, Hitler told Manstein that he intended to give Army Group South a new name. Furthermore, he gave her to understand that he would call on her services in the near future, as soon as the German army could again launch major offensives. So he told him that he must remain at his disposal until then, for he was going to be called back into service at any moment. Giving him greater hope, he even told him that he was considering the possibility of appointing him commander-in-chief of the Western Front, a position still held by Marshal Rundstedt. Finally, the Führer wished him the best for his right eye operation and a speedy recovery. Throughout their conversation, Hitler was courteous, even cordial, and assured Manstein that there was no discord between them. Obviously, he did not want the German marshal to be among his enemies. In the spring of 1944, shortly after having relieved Manstein of his command, Hitler expressed to Jodl his own opinion of the German marshal. In my opinion, Manstein has an enormous talent for operations. There is no doubt about it. And if you had an army of, say, 20 divisions at full strength and in peacetime conditions, I couldn't think of a better commander to his leadership than Marshal Manstein. He would know exactly what to do with this great army, and he would do it admirably. He would move them like lightning, but always on the condition that he had first-class equipment. If we could create an army like that again, I am sure that I will employ Manstein, because he is certainly one of our most capable officers. He can maneuver with divisions as long as they are in good condition. But otherwise, he does not know what to do with worn-out divisions, so in these circumstances, we are in, someone like him is of no use to us. A few months later, at the end of March 1945, he repeated the same thing again, this time to Guderian. If you had 40 divisions with all their offensive capabilities intact to decisively defeat the enemy, then only Manstein would be eligible to command these troops. But I can't use it in the current situation. He lacks faith in National Socialism. He cannot withstand the pressure that a commanding general faces in the current military situation. Well, once we have seen what the meeting between Rommel and Manstein was like, and the opinion that the German leader had about him, describing him as his most competent marshal, let's now analyze what Manstein's visit to Hitler in Berlin at the end of January 1945. This meeting took place on January 29, 1945, when the Soviets were reaching the shore of the Oder River, and were located just 70 kilometers from Berlin. At that time, Manstein was in Berlin, and took the opportunity to go to the Reich Chancellery to request a meeting with Hitler. As we have just indicated, since Manstein was dismissed almost a year earlier, the marshal had been awaiting the promised new position, which the German leader had given him to understand was going to be imminent. On several occasions, Manstein, maintaining this hope, commented the following in his private circle. When Hitler is up to his neck in water, he will call me. In this way, and seeing that the situation could not be more critical, Manstein went to see Hitler with the intention of finally being given a new army to lead. With this objective, on the afternoon of January 29th, Manstein entered the Reich Chancellery, accompanied by his assistant. Two SS men sitting at a table stood up and greeted him. Manstein responded, raising his marshal's baton. I am Marshal von Manstein. Please inform the Führer that I am here, and that I want to speak with him.
Manstein said. Then one of the two SS men asked him. Do you have an appointment, Mr. Marshall? Manstein said that he didn't have any, but that he had come on important business. Immediately afterwards, one of the guards went to a lower level to report what was happening, and received new orders to either let him enter or prevent him from passing. After half an hour of waiting, the guard returned to the room where Manstein was and told him that he was not going to be received by the Fuhrer. Manstein angrily asked him if the Fuhrer himself or any of his assistants had really received the news that he was there. The guard told him yes, but that even though everyone knew who he was, they had decided not to receive him. If I cannot speak to the Fuhrer, I demand to speak at least with some of the high-ranking officers who are with him, Manstein said. I'm sorry, Mr. Marshall, I have orders not to let anyone pass, the guard finally said. Manstein then stood up abruptly and left the room without saying hello. That none of Hitler's aides were willing to receive him he took as a great insult. Thus, and in a paradoxical way, not even in a chaotic situation could he find work, and it became more than clear that they would never count on him again.